What's up everybody? Welcome to Urban Crest Online. It is an amazing day to have you with us and I am so excited to hear the powerful word Pastor Thomas prepared for us. And if you are too, you better get your Urban Crest app open right now so you can follow along line by line, note by note. Get it ready. But before we do that, let's prepare our hearts before the Lord in worship. Let's get our voices ready. Let's get our hands in the air. Stand up wherever you are because it's time. I am ready. Are you ready? Let's go. Lord, you are the calm in the storm. Oh, and we know that we can cling to you and find our safety. And we turn to you in this time. I cast my mind to Calvary. Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They
creator You spoke and stars began to shine Began to shine Our Father You breathed the breath and gave us life You gave us life You're the same today as you were in the beginning, you remain unchanged. God of all power, King of all glory, you do wonderful things. God of all creation, King of our salvation. the cross, at the cross, oh Jesus, you're breathing life again in us, again in us, so you're the same today as you were in the Well, good morning once again, church. Thank you so much for joining us today. At this time in our service, we do want to pause for a time of prayer. And I pray that wherever you are right now, that you join me in this season of prayer. We've experienced a wonderful time of worship already. We want our hearts and our minds and our spirits to be prepared, even now, to receive the word of the Lord. I pray that you'll take your copy of scripture, that you'll follow along in the app, and, and, and you'll just be blessed today by hearing the word of the Lord. 
We also want to pray for our country today. We want to pray for a variety of needs that might be in each of our lives. And again, this is our opportunity as the church to go before the Lord, to bring our request, and to leave them in His great care. I know that He hears our prayers today, and I'm thrilled that He answers. Let's join our hearts together for a season of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we want to thank You for the day. We want to thank You for the opportunity as a church to gather ourselves and to hear Your Word proclaimed, to lift up songs of praise and worship unto You, to take the Lord's Supper together, all of these wonderful things that You've blessed us with today. And right now, Father, we do pause during this time of worship service to be ever mindful that you are the giver of life, of life eternal. We want to thank you for that. We want to thank you that we can raise our voices in songs of praise today. We want to thank you for the word of God that we have that leads us and guides us in all aspects of life. I do pray that our hearts and our minds would be ready to receive from you today. Be with our pastor as he brings the word. I pray for everything that we say and do today. May it bring your great name glory. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Urban Crest Baptist Church. Hey, if you've got a Bible, turn to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to look at uh, verse 16 as we begin a brand new series today, studying how did we get the Bible. And I've I've entitled the first two or three messages, Bible 101, Bible 102, Bible 103. That simple. Uh, We're going to look at some of the very basic stuff today about the Bible, the books of the Bible, what their main theme were. And then we're going to talk about, of course, how we got it, its importance in our life. Can it be trusted? And word trust is a big word. And has it been proven trustworthy? So in 2 Timothy chapter 3, you have this verse, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Now, when I did a devotion, no, oh, two or three months ago, I used this passage of scripture and I talked about the fact that this verse was given to us to put us on the right path, but not only put us on the path, keep us on the path. And so we looked at the fact that doctrine shows us the path that we walk on. So when we talk about the doctrine of how we got the Bible, It shows us its validity. We study from its origins all the way through, and we build what the Bible calls a doctrine or a teaching. Doctrine, we keep learning it when we come to church and we preach, whether a pastor says, hey, we're going to talk about the doctrine of grace today or the doctrine of forgiveness. That's what we're teaching. We just don't use that word very much anymore. But doctrine shows me the path that I'm supposed to walk on. Reproof shows me where I got off the path. So reproof comes into my life and it rebukes me. It does all of those kind of things. And then correction shows me how to get back on the path. So doctrine, this is the path. Reproof, I got off the path. Correction, here's how you get back on the path. And then instructions and righteousness, and that shows us how to stay on that path. So when we look at God's word, he says all of it is given by inspiration of God. It's interesting when people talk to me and sometimes they want to debate about what kind of translation do you use. And I'm King James only, or I'm ESV, or I'm a new King James, I'm NIV, all these other kind of things. One of the things I always look back at them and I say, hey guys, have you ever read it? That's one thing to claim your translation, but have you really ever read it? I mean, do you, have you ever read the book of Haggai and wonder why he wrote that? Micah, Nahum? I mean, Nahum's mother must not have loved him or something. That's the only thing I can figure with a name like Nahum. So, uh, listen, every bit of it, 100% from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to Revelation, the very last chapter, last verse, is inspired by God and it is used to teach us. Now, so I, I thought I would talk about, first of all, the Bible and just make the bold statement, it is 
the Word of God. Now, if you've got a Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. I'm going to read the verse for you. The Bible basically says, Men were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they spoke from God, and they recorded Scripture from, all, from Almighty God Himself. So it was the Holy Spirit who did that. So the Bible is the Word of God. It claims to be the truth. It claims to be the message from God to man. Now remember, Jesus said, or Paul said, we, we have the mind of Christ. That's what God's Word is. It's Christ's thoughts. It's His mind. It's in teaching. The Scriptures were written by approximately 40 different men is one of the first things that we need to look at. Secondly, these men lived in several different countries, several different cultures. They lived in different eras from 1400 B.C. all the way through A.D. and some would argue 95, 96. I put A.D. 90, so we just won't have to worry about it. All right. Well, we're not going to argue over a couple of years of when it was written. It was written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic and Greek. In your notes, despite these differences, according to 1 Peter, God moved the writers to focus on his glory uh, in man's redemption through the one central figure, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Dr. Adrian Rogers used to say this, the Bible has but one hero, and his name is Jesus. The Bible has but one villain, his name is Satan, and the Bible has but one message, Jesus saves. So understand, despite all of the differences, God moved the writers to focus on the glory of man's redemption from Genesis 1, God is redeeming man, all the way to Revelation chapter 20. God is redeeming mankind, and one day we will be all brought into the presence of God the Father forever and ever. So let's just do some basic studying for just a moment. Let's talk about the Old Testament. Many of us, when we were kids, we uh, we were able to just quote the books of the Bible. I, I'm still astounded. Uh, a few weeks ago, I'm out in the foyer, and uh, little Violet, who is uh, uh, Ellie and Nate Music's daughter, she stood there and quoted to me all 66 books of the Bible. Can I help you on this one? I couldn't. I don't think I could do that. I mean, I might get them all, but I'd get them all mixed up. I can tell you that much. But whether you have them memorized or not, there's a purpose behind each of those books. So what I thought we would do, we would talk about the books. One, it's just a one-line sentence as the major theme of that book. And some, it'll be just a, a bullet form. It's not going to encompass the whole thing, but it's going to give us the main theme of that book. So the Old Testament, we know, has 39 books. The first five books of the Bible are what we call the Pentateuch, the five books put together. And they consist, first of all, in your notes, of Genesis. And Genesis is the book of beginnings. Uh, it's creation, it's man, it's sin, it's redemption, it's God's nation, but it's the book of beginnings. How did creation begin? How did man get here? Where did sin originate from? Where did redemption come from? And we get all that in the first three chapters. And then we see God form him a nation in Genesis chapter 12 with Abraham. So it's a beginning book. Then there's the book of Exodus. And Exodus has this theme, God delivers his people, and in this case, from Egypt. But the inference is God always will redeem his people. He will remain faithful even if I am faithless, Paul wrote to Timothy. God will be faithful. And then Leviticus come along. And I tell you, I always joke about Leviticus when we're when I'm talking about teaching people how to read the Bible who are baby Christians. Uh, don't ever start in Leviticus. By chapter 6, you'll hate goats. I mean, you just, you're just you like, what is this deal with all these goats and these animals and stuff? But Leviticus, its main theme, it teaches us sacrificially about atonement, the holiness of God. Whether we realize it or not, Leviticus teaches us more about worship than just about any other book in the Bible. Instruction, sacrifice, purifications, that's all in that book of Leviticus. And then the book of Numbers. 
See, you, you don't realize preachers are always counting people and we count nickels and noses and all these kind of different things. Yeah, maybe you didn't even realize there's a book of numbers in the Bible. I mean, Jesus fed 5,000 on one occasion, 4,000 on another, called 12 disciples, had sent 70 out. All of somebody counted somewhere. Numbers is God's people continually disobeying God and wandering from God in the wilderness, and it's going to focus on that number 40, 40 years of rebellion. And God numbered his people. He wanted his people to know that I will still love you. You're still my chosen people. I will not abandon you and, and walk away from you. Deuteronomy is my favorite book in, of the Pentateuch, and here's why. Uh, you get a second chance. Uh, Deuteros is a number. It's two. God telling his people twice. He loved them so much, not only did he tell them once and record it all, when they walked away from him, he set them back down and told them a second time. Have you ever said to your wife about your kid, how many times am I going to have to tell that kid before they get it? I mean, how many times before they get it? Listen, the book of Deuteronomy, it's Moses' greatest discourse uh, on preparing Israel to enter into the promised land, and it's all about God saying, listen, let me teach you again. We are going into the promised land. I bet it's been on a 40-year merry-go-round in the desert, 40 years of the wind blowing in their face, the sand hitting them in the face, and now God's favor has returned, and they're getting ready to move into the promised land. So those five books, uh, author Moses, of course, and those put together for you and I, so that we might know how things started. We might know about the redemption and atoning work of God. And then we run into what's called the history books. And that's the second category. And there's 12 books in there. Um, number one is the book of Joshua. Joshua focuses on Israel's uh, Israel conquering the promised land, focuses on the 12 tribes of Israel, the deviation of the land of the promised land, all of that, and all of the, the tribal importance is brought out in the book of um, Joshua. Secondly, is the book of Judges. And Israel enters into a cycle of turning from God, and God will raise up what's called a judge to bring judgment to them, a message, and then they would turn to God. And so he used a variety of people over a period of time, but that's what the whole book of Judges is. God used a human being to convey a message to his people when they walked away. Listen, aren't you glad God loves you so much that he'll send somebody by your door to tell you if you're walking away from him to try to point you back to him? That's the book of Judges. Then the, the book of Ruth comes along, and what a book of uh, redemption. And it mainly focuses on two ladies, two widows. They lose everything, and but they find hope in Israel. And God uses uh, Naomi, and God uses Ruth in a spectacular way, and Ruth will become a part of the bloodline, the succession line of the Lord Jesus Christ, even as a Gentile. Number four, then you hit the books of First Samuel and Second Samuel. You say, now, Pastor, this is pretty basic. Yes, it is. It sure is. But I'm convinced in America today that most of our culture out there, most of Christianity is biblically illiterate. And I don't say it as a, in a derogatory way, but I'm telling you, sometimes we got to go back to the basics to understand how precious this book is. First Samuel and Second Samuel. In First Samuel, remember, Israel demanded a king who turned out to be quite a disappointment. He will die in a battlefield. His body will be hung up on the walls of the Philistines, uh, wall, uh, barriers. His head will be hanging in their heathen temple because of their disobedience and turning away from God. But they, see, Israel was what we call a theocracy. They were run by God, and they said, we're tired of that. We want a king. And boy, God gave them what they wanted, but it wasn't what they needed. But he gave it to them because of their desire to teach them. Second Samuel comes along, and man, things change. We hear about a guy by the name of David, a man who is after God's own heart, and how he becomes the king of Israel. And the Bible says in the book of Psalms, and God chose David and he kept the sheep. Lowest form of job in all of Israel. Unclean job, smelly job. I mean, 
David would walk in a room and people would kind of go, wow, they just bit their nose. They're like, this is, for y'all that are my generation, they'd look at each other and go, this is a good place for a stick up right here. And you look that one up on Google and you'll see that commercial, okay? So first and second kings come along in the history chapters. And first kings, Israel have a has a time of peace, prosperity, and then they turn away from God. This is a habitual pattern with Israel. But kings is written to show us again how much God loves a disobedient nation. He wants to bring them back to himself. In second kings, both kingdoms. I mean, now we have a northern and a southern kingdom. They ignore God until they fall into captivity to other world empires. And then you come along with the books of Chronicles, the history books. And the first Chronicles is the is a history book of Adam, basically, to David. Second Chronicles goes to Solomon, David's son, and who rebuilds or builds the temple rather, and it culminates in the Babylonians who will destroy it. Throughout these historical books, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, you see the pattern. God loving his people unconditionally, blessing his people, whatever reason, they walk away from him. God loves them, goes back, puts discipline in their life to bring them back to him. And it's the story of how God dealt with a nation. Then Ezra comes along. And Ezra, the whole focus there, the Israelites return from captivity. They been to, begin to rebuild the temple and, and, and do the work on it. And Ezra begins to teach again in Israel. And he begins to teach obedience to God and teach why we went into bondage and why we can never, ever do it again. But boy, he faced such opposition that the work never got completed till a guy came along, the next book in the Bible called Nehemiah. See, Jerusalem, when Nehemiah gets there, is in, in, is in pitiful shape. And Nehemiah rebuilds the walls around the city and he does it in record time. Nehemiah teaches us one thing. How do you rebuild a broken life? How do you rebuild a broken wall? One brick at a time. But here was what was interesting about Nehemiah. Nehemiah just didn't go in there and start laying brick. Nehemiah went around the walls of Jerusalem and dug up all of the footers and, and put new footers in. Because you realize sometimes we just go to the surface in our life, but we don't dig enough to get to the root, to the foundation of the problem. And Nehemiah understood it, but he rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, did it in record time, and God's temple was restored. Then you come to a a lady in the Bible who was used by God in a spectacular way, her name is, is Esther, and there was a, a plot of genocide that came about to bring Israel's extinction about. And Esther is asked to intervene and help, and God would use her in such a marvelous way, or as um, it was said to her, uh, it is God has put you in this position for such a time as this. Listen, we're in a critical junction in our, na our nation today. We're getting ready to, to, to pray. We're getting ready to spend 21 days in prayer. I'm teaching about fasting, getting close to God as close as we can, interceding. That's what Esther did. She called for a three-day fast. She went into the presence of the king who could have had her slain right there, coming in uninvited. And she interceded on behalf of the nation of Israel, and God used her in a spectacular way. And the book of Esther records that for us. And then, you know, we hit the books of poetry in the Bible. Now, I don't know how big you are on poetry. I mean, my poetry when I was growing up was always roses are red, violets are blue, something like your mama's ugly, so are you. I mean, we just come up with all kinds of little sayings and and different things. And uh, then, then that little poetry became a key in my life as I began to grow spiritually. And I would always remind myself of a little poem, roses are red, violets are blue. Is this the wisest thing to do? And it's amazing how many times that little poem came back into my mind that saved my bacon on so many times. So the books of poetry, we would have the book of Job. Job talks about in your notes the suffering and the loyal trust of a man who loved God and how God worked in his life in an incredible way uh, to bring about a restoration to Job after God had picked him out of a crowd to pick on him. 
and God would use him in a spectacular way. Then we get to the book of Psalms. They are songs of praise. They are songs of instruction. They're psalms of worship. They're psalms where, man, David is going to bear his heart before a world in a psalm, and God's going to write it down. Uh, the greatest psalm we have is one of great repentance found in Psalm 51 after David had walked away from God and Bathsheba, that whole story. And, and uh, man, he came back to God and that great psalm that we have of repentance. Oh, what a, what a joy it is to be able to sing those types of songs to the Lord. And then we have the book of Proverbs. And Solomon wrote this great book for us. And it is God's practical wisdom for daily life. It's interesting. The book of uh, Proverbs has basically three primary characters. One is what is called the wise. And a wise man in the book of Proverbs is one who knows God. And he does what God says. Then you have what's called a fool. And the fool does not know God, and he does not do what God says. But then you have a third category that comes in there, and listen to what this one is. This is called a scoffer. And a scoffer is one who does not know God, but makes fun of the people who do obey God and know him. So you have this great discourse going on through the book of Proverbs about the wise, the fool, and the scoffer. And so it's practical wisdom. Dr. Billy Graham used to say his uh, pattern of devotion, he, he read five Psalms a day and he read one chapter of the book of Proverbs. There's 31 chapters there every day. And here's what he said. The psalmist teaches me about my relationship with God. The writer of Proverb teaches me about my relationship with man. So you understand now the value of those books. If you're not doing devotional studies or devotions and reading the book of Proverbs, start. Listen, one of my favorite Proverbs, a soft answer turns away wrath. Man, how many times that saved my bacon? Because I'm a redneck and every now and then you get attacked and you want to retaliate as the world would retaliate. And all of a sudden, boom, God hits you with the scripture. I mean, it's almost like a mic drop. Poop, there it is. A soft answer, Tom, turns away wrath. You can do it your way or my way. My way works better than yours. So start reading the book of Proverbs. Then we hit the book of Ecclesiastes, and the writer of, of Proverbs, is uh, Solomon, is writing about the emptiness of an earthly life without God. Wow. Let me say that again. The emptiness of an earthly life without God. You understand how empty right now the United States of America is? We're trying to live our life without God. And the book of Ecclesiastes says, don't do it. Don't do it. Whatever you do, don't do it. Then you hit the probably one that's less least read of all the poetry books, because uh, it is a intimate, passionate relationship between a husband and wife. I mean, if we really read it and brought out the Hebrew, it would be rated R. Everybody okay? And Song of Solomon is just a celebration of marital joy between a husband and wife. And I mean, it, it'll get graphic in there and talk all kinds. I'm not going to go into it. And you got kids running around your living room. Just read it yourself sometimes. But it is a great, great book of poetry and teaches us, guys, it teaches us how to love our wives and how to be there for them. It's just a wonderful thing. Then you hit what we call major and minor prophets. So let's talk about the major prophets real quickly. First, you've got Isaiah. Uh, God sends the prophet Isaiah to warn about judgment and to tell everybody about Jesus. When I was in Israel several years ago, Donna and I were there and we were on an educational trip. And uh, as we were going through and we were driving through the streets of Jerusalem and told me, uh, apologies, let me back up. We were in uh, Qumran, Dead Sea, and on our way to Qumran and then back up to um, to Jericho, uh, we went by the place in Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And our translator, who was not a believer in Christ, he was a Jewish man, but he talked about the fact of the findings of the Dead Sea Scroll. He was a tremendously educated man. And he said, you know, one of the major finds of the book of Isaiah was the book of Isaiah because the earliest copy up to that point that we'd had of Isaiah was like 1100 AD, 1100 years after Christ. And when 
Qumran was discovered, they found a scroll of Isaiah dating back to 200 years before Christ. Now, you say, Pastor, so what? Well, listen, what I'm going to tell you. The Jewish nation for years demanded that Isaiah 53, that chapter, be taken out because they said that chapter was added by Gentiles. And so Isaiah 53, if you don't know it, read it. It's about the suffering Savior. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. By his stripes we were healed. All of those great verses there. Now, 200 years before the time of Christ, you have it dating all the way back, and they realize now we have a problem. The Gentiles didn't add in 1100 A.D. the Isaiah 53. It's been there all along. Now we got to deal with this Savior that's out there. Of course, they rejected Christ once. They reject him again. Trust me. Then the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah sends a prophet to warn Israel about a Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah was a guy who, the uh, Bible describes him as a weeping prophet, a guy who was very compassionate, very moved. Man, listen to me. Isaiah was a Bible-thumping Baptist preacher. I mean, a fundamentalist guy. Uh, so powerful was his messages that kings got to a point where they hate him. And, of course, Hebrews chapter 11 tells us about Isaiah's death. He was actually put in a hollow log and sawed in two because the king hated his messages so much. And then you got the book of Lamentations. Um, they're basically, we'd call them dirges. Uh, lamenting the fall of Jerusalem. I mean, they're like dirge songs and just gloom and despair type things, but it, it's, it captured the heart of the people at the fall of Jerusalem. And of course, then you got Ezekiel and Ezekiel speaks to Israel to teach them about the justice and the error of their ways. God is just in disciplining you and this, this is where you left him. And if you'll come back to him, that's God's always God's invitation. If you'll come back to me, I will restore you back to myself. Tragically, the Jewish nation, um, they just did not return to God. Oh, there were some, there was a remnant always, like the next book of the Bible, Daniel. Daniel became a high-ranking wise man uh, um, in the Babylonian empire. He was known for his prophetic visions, his interpreting of dreams. And God used Daniel in such a tremendous way to bring some light to the Israel nation when they were being held in captivity. Aren't you glad God always has a light in the darkness? He always does. In the midst of the darkness, God always has a light. And you're listening to this maybe in your living room this morning right now. Can I tell you something? God loves you. God cares for you. He always will shine light into your life if you'll let him. So I want to encourage you today, if you've never trusted Jesus, if you've never turned to Jesus and Jesus, today I'm trusting you for my eternal destiny. I believe, Jesus, you died for me. I know I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And Jesus, today, I'm no longer trusting in myself. I'm no longer trusting in my good works. I'm no longer trusting in my good deeds. I'm no longer trusting in my morality, my baptism, whatever you want to throw in there. Jesus, today, I'm trusting you and you alone for salvation. Would you do that right now? In the privacy of your home, just simply pray, Jesus, I'm trusting you now. Change my life. Thank you for saving me. I put all of my eternal life in your hands. I trust you with my soul. For we who know us, let's dive into this book. Let's understand God wrote all 66 of these books so that we might know him better. We might know how he loves us and he cares for us. Father, in Jesus' name, use this message today. Use this message to speak into our lives, into the lives of a nation that is rebellious, in the life of a nation that uh, is entitled, at least they feel they are, in light of a nation that has committed spiritual adultery against you. Father, we beg and we plead for forgiveness for our nation today. We pray forgiveness for our churches. We pray forgiveness for our people. I pray forgiveness for myself. Lord Jesus, as we study this, may we become so enamored by this book that it does truly become once again precious in our life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you, church.
Well, Urban Crest, we're glad that you can join us online today, and we have the privilege to take the Lord's Supper together. Pastor Dave and I are going to serve the cup, and we'll serve the bread to you today as we remember what Jesus did for us. I'm so glad that my past doesn't dictate my future, but that Jesus Christ has forgiven me, and He's forgiven me for every sin. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is the scripture text that we use for serving the Lord's Supper, and the Apostle Paul uh, gave those instructions to us. And as you prepare and go ahead and get the bread out and the wafer, if you're using what we have given you, go ahead and unseal that now. And let me read the scripture for you and I. And the scripture says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus... On the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he given thanks, Jesus broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Shall we? Now, Father, we thank you for the sinless body of Jesus Christ, that he was conceived in the womb by a virgin, born without the sin nature of Adam. And as the scripture tells us, in Adam all die, but in Christ all are made alive. We are alive today because of that body that Jesus gave, that sinless sacrificial lamb that gave himself willingly as a sheep led to the slaughter. He laid his life down for, for me and for the entire world. And Father, we remember today that sacrifice and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The scripture continues and tells us that in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And as we pause now to take the cup, let's, let's be reminded of the blood of the Lord Jesus, the sacrifice that was given for each one of us. Uh, let's be grateful and let's do so with thankful hearts today. Take. Father, we want to thank you for the precious gift of the Lord Jesus. I want to thank you for his broken body. We thank you for his spilled blood for each one of us on Calvary. And we thank you for the covenant now that is ours through Christ and the salvation that he gives to us. How we give your great name yes. praise and glory for the opportunity we've had to remember this day. And we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The scripture goes on to say in verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I, I've said many times over my 31 years of pastoring, I never tire of reading that verse. Amen. Jesus is sovereignly in control and he's coming again. Wouldn't it be awesome if Jesus came back this week? What a celebration time we would have. We look forward to the day when Christ returns, we'll celebrate this supper before the throne. We love you, church. We just pray God's best for you this week. Tell somebody that Jesus loves them. Offer them hope today, I pray in Jesus' name. God bless you. But thank you, Pastor, for that powerful word. You know what? I'm not even going to type it. You go, boy. Good preaching. <laughs> but I'm gonna give you guys a chance to do the exact same thing. So right there in your chat, go ahead and type anything that you think would encourage our pastor because he has been bringing it. You go, good preaching, good word, or just how about a great big thank you.
Yeah. Another thing, if you have questions, if you have、uh, something in your notes that you're like, wait a minute, what does this mean? Go ahead and ask that in your chat right now. I'm going to give you just a few seconds to do it. Go. If you're wondering what I'm doing in that like quiet moment, I'm literally just counting one, two, three, four. Never mind. So you guys, right now, we wanted to give you the opportunity at this point in the service to give. But I wanted to encourage you with something、um, because it's just it's a really really cool thing. Mayor Amy Brewer was looking to find some masks to help、uh, our seniors that are in elder care facilities, and so so cool. Because of your generosity, we were able to donate three. Thousand masks to help the seniors in this community. That's an amazing, amazing gift. She was asking for a few. We said we got three thousand. She said I'll take them. So because of your generosity, we are able to help out on a scale that is kind of unimaginable. So really, really, thank you so much.、Uh, and please go to God as you make these important decisions and ask Him what He would have you do. Well, you guys, it has been an amazing week here at Urban Crest Online. We love having you here. It is so sad to see you go, but please come back and join us again next week. In the meantime, like this video, subscribe to the channel, and definitely hit that notification bell so you know when we're online doing the cool things we get to do right here with you. Until next time, you guys, be good. We'll see ya. Bye.